Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. As you know, we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on Oneness in Christ. This is lesson number 11 in that series entitled Unity and Worship. It's the lesson for December 15 of 2018. This is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a very, I, I found it to be a very provocative lesson, something to think about, to challenge your thinking, maybe something you hadn't thought of before. So, as usual, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we recognize your presence with us at all times, but especially as we open your word and study together and think about the meanings of, of what you have tried to teach us. As we talk about things like the third angel's message, the second, first, second, and third angel's messages, which is supposed to be our message, our, our, our thing that we're supposed to take to the world, what does it say to us about worship? Well, help us to understand it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have claimed almost from the beginning that the three angels' messages are our message to the world. We haven't always understood them in the same way as we do now. Uh, that's not too surprising. But um, we've not often focused on the fact that this message is largely about worship. Worship? It talks about worship in the first message, worshiping and honoring God. It talks about false worship in the second message. And it talks about false message worship in the third message. Do we understand all that's involved in both true and false worship? Do we understand what these messages, these three messages, these messages that we're supposed to know forward and backward and upside and downside and be able to tell anybody about them even in our sleep, do we know what they, what they say about worship? Well, from the earliest days of the Christian church, which of course we study as an example for many Question. things. Yes, Gordon. By your statement so far, are you implying that all of the Seventh Day Adventist Church interprets the three angels' messages the same? I thought I carefully tried to say that wasn't true. <laughs> okay. You do later on. I certainly will. As we, we'll see as we move along. Okay. Well, the early church spent a great deal of time in worship, a way more probably than we do. They learned from the disciples all they could learn about the life and death of Jesus, and they fellowshiped together, breaking bread and praying together, as it says in Acts 2.42. It was a very exciting time to be alive. I mean, imagine yourself having been present at Pentecost. Wow. And the 3,000 people that were baptized that day, we don't, we don't have any idea how they did that. I mean, there was no place around Jerusalem that you could even begin to baptize 3,000 people. I don't know. Good question. But exciting things were happening and they were, people who had money were bringing it and sharing it with people who didn't and there was an incredible amount of fellowship and study and prayer. There was constant talk about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Imagine, imagine hearing about that from the original disciples. What would they say? What would they say about their experience hiding in the upper room with the door locked? They had to be pretty excited. I mean, this had just happened. Yeah, exactly. We're going to see all that someday in 3D living color, spread across the sky. Well, Peter, remembering it many years later, described us as a holy priesthood. First Peter 2, 5. Where did he get that idea? Anybody have any idea? God called the children of Israel a holy priesthood back in Exodus 19, just before he gave the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. So Peter is doing what here? He's taking an idea from the Old Testament. And he's saying the Jewish people aren't God's people anymore, specifically, selectively, but now it is God's church that are the ones to carry the message to the world. Well, what about us? Are we expressing gratitude to God in community and a community of worship? That kind of worship would transform people's hearts and minds into the likeness of the character of God. It should also prepare us for service. And shouldn't service automatically lead to unity, which is our focus for this quarter? Each week as we come together to celebrate and worship, if we took the opportunity to talk about the wonderful things that God has done for us, or had done for us that previous week, as we served him, what would happen in the church? 
Wow. So this week, let, let's take a look. Yes, Gordon. Can I go back? Just, yeah. just, you mentioned Exodus 19. So Peter reinterpreted Exodus 19 under inspiration. He did that. He, he applied it to a new group of people. Yeah, applied it, yeah. Do we dare do that? What do you think? Of course, we will do it all every time we have a chance. Yeah, we, we and, and fairly... It may, it may not be inspired, what we say. Well, but hold on. Peter also told us these things are written not for us, but for people who live at the end of time. He says prophets in the Old Testament received messages and it wasn't primarily for them, but for us. And he was talking about himself as if he lived in the end of time. So, yeah. I, and, I mean, and look at the wealth of material that we have available to us that no previous generation has had. So this week, let's not only look at the events connected with the worship, but also what the worship itself means. For example, Psalms 29, verse 2. As soon as I can check on my computer here. Praise the Lord's glorious name, bow down before the Holy One when He appears. That's a clear message. Do we really recognize the worth of God? Do we give Him the glory due to His name? Look at what we know about the word worship and its derivatives from Hebrew and Greek, and I should say ancient Latin. Carrie, I think you have something on that. I do. The word worship that we know had quite an interesting history. It's known as a noun. Middle English, it was worship with the E after the P. Then it goes to worthiness, respect, reverence paid to a divine being. From Old English, we of Skype, worthiness, respect from we of or worthy, worth, and Skype and ship are added to different words. And that was before the 12th century, and that came from Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. Hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Worship. Oh, okay, I thought you wanted to do that. Oh, I will do, I could do it. Worship, Hebrew generally a form of shacha, to bow down or to worship. In the Greek, it's generally from the, verb la, from the word latruo, to serve, especially with respect to the outward forms of worship, and proskuneo, to do obeisance or to prostrate oneself to reverence. The attitude of humility, reverence, honor, devotion, and adoration that properly mark the relationship of the created beings to their creator, especially in his presence. The Bible teaches that such worship is due to the one true God alone, and there's a whole collection of verses there in our handouts, which, by the way, are available to you if you want to check online at our website. That's theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So, there's something else very interesting. Revelation 4 and 5 show us a very interesting picture of heaven. There are creatures and elders how many creatures and how many elders? 24 elders. Yeah. And four living four creatures. creatures. Four okay. Creatures. Surrounding the throne of God, whatever that comprises, whoever those people are. They're constantly praising God. Jesus told, that there, told us that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. That's found in Luke 15 and it's repeated in verses 7 and 10. Is that why the, building, the beings surrounding the throne of God are rejoicing? Do we have any idea what they mean by creatures? Especially when there are only four. Yeah. Nope. Not three, like God. But From that wording, it would seem like they're saying the uh, same as the other. Yeah. No, nobody that I know of has any idea what kind of creatures those are. Well, they're described in uh, Ezekiel. Well, yeah, and you know, one's an eagle and one's a cow and or a bull, or another was a human and the third one is what uh, sheep, I think, is the fourth one. I don't know that that helps us. Yeah, I, I don't know that helps us very much. When I read that, I thought that's strange. Here, here's my question to you: Do you think our supremely intelligent God, who's responsible for everything that happens in the entire universe? is happy to have those 
people always saying exactly the same thing. Do, 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 do. Well, maybe they can't contain themselves, <laughs> but that's the best single thing is reverence, holy, holy, holy. It's not uh, that God wants them to do that. That's just spontaneous. Well, what it, or is that just an indication of the fact that they're constantly glorifying God with whatever the latest news is that's coming in? Whatever they're doing. Yeah. Is that like a constant cheer, like at a sporting yeah. event? Yeah. They're just constantly, that, yay! That's a good point. And the 24 elders, what do they do? They throw their crowns down in front of him. Yeah. Do they ever go and pick them up? Definitely. Do they know which crown belongs to who? You know, there's lots of questions, and I'm not trying to be facetious here at all. I'm just saying that we, we need to look at these sort of unusual images we read in the Bible and try to figure if, if they say something important to us. But all of these beings surrounding the throne of God um, are constantly giving him glory, honor, power, and praise. Now, I would like to suggest something else which we will talk about more next quarter, and that's that these people, people, beings, whatever they are there, they are the primary audience. They're the very first ones to hear about anything that God is gonna do. It's not us, we're not the first ones to hear. We're out on the periphery somewhere. These beings are the, so they're the ones who are, who are the primary audience for the entire great controversy. Think about the implications of that. Well, in Revelation 5, 9 to 14, they proclaim that Jesus is worthy to take the scroll and break and open its seals. Now, we could talk a long time about that, and we probably will next quarter, but Jesus is the only one that's found worthy, and we're talking about being worthy of worship. So why was Jesus the only one who was worthy? Because he was the lamb that was slain. Okay, and he was intimately involved. He is, as the member of the God who, whose primary responsibility is to rate, relate to his creatures, he was the one who orchestrated everything in the plan of salvation from beginning to end. So surely he is one who would be worthy. Um, well, Margaret, I think you have Yeah, Revelation 5, 12. The lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and praise. This is from the American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay. Now, I look at that and I say, okay, who could possibly give power to God? wealth to God, wisdom to God, strength to God. Now I can understand we could consider him worthy. We could, we could give him honor, glory, and praise. But those other things, I'm not quite sure what that implies. Well, God's ways sometimes seem a little, maybe more than a little bit strange to us. Imagine winning the great, great controversy, the biggest war of all time by dying. Of course, he had to rise from the grave three days later to confirm that his victory was successful. But what leads to all this worship in the throne room of God in heaven? From our perspective here on planet Earth, does it really seem, as you look around you, does it really seem like God is winning? This past week, mm -hmm. I'm reading right now in the section of scripture and looking at the commentary from the daily Bible study series and Peter Craigie made a comment that caught my attention that relates a bit to this. He said, the passage of history is not a random process. The central message of all the prophets is that God was and is sovereign and is in charge and has a purpose. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely. I mean, exactly. It's, we need, it's and Ellen White. a random White. process. Yeah. It's not just random. Ellen it looks White. like it to the average person. Yeah. Ellen White said something like that, you know, and there's one place she says, you know, the events that are happening in our world might seem to be kind of random, whatever, I guess, but she says, if we could see behind the scenes, mm -hmm. God's hand is moving and so forth like that. Yeah. Well, when events on planet Earth come to an end, God's faithful people will also worship him by saying, Jim? Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. O King of the Saints, 
Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Revelation 15, 3 to 4, New King James Version. Okay, so it sounds like there's going to be a lot more praising and honoring God and worshiping God in the future, right? The time will come. So why do we worship God? Well, for one <laughs> simple thing, without him we wouldn't exist. No, he's our creator, our he's sustainer. Mm -hmm. so Redeemer. Mm -hmm. But we should worship him for more than that. It's not just existence that we get from him. We should worship him because of who he is and the way he behaves. I mean, a God who would run a universe on the principle of love, that's, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. We should adore him, we should reverence him, we should praise him, we love him, we obey him because he is worthy. Fortunately for us, he has chosen to reveal himself through the Holy Scriptures, and thus we can get to know him. We worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because of all that they have done for us, but even more so because their very nature because of their very natures, resulting in the way they run their universe. We worship them because their very, uh, their very nature, love, is the only way to run a universe with transparency and fairness. Now, think about the governments that we know about here in this world. Are there any of them that are fully transparent? No. no. None. And the stuff that goes on behind the scene, I mean, even church governments, we are reading about all sorts of terrible things being carried out by people who should be spiritual leaders. In contrast to Satan's way, which is selfishness, there can be no comparison. Selfishness is, by its nature, self-destructive. Jesus himself said to Philip, when Philip questioned him in John 14, 8 to 24, that if we have seen him, that is, if we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Father. Would things be at all different if the Father had come instead of the Son? Gordon? Ellen White answered that in the book, That I May Know Him, page 338. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God in sight, in hearing, in effect. It is the voice and movements of the Father. I have been looking at this issue quite a bit in the last uh, two, three months, and I'm, I have become very convinced that every night Jesus would go out and in prayer would plan for the next day with his Father. Be the night before he chose the disciples, he prayed all night. This wasn't just, you know, re repetition of some rosary or something like that. This was planning with his Father how they were going to choose the disciples, what were the pros and cons of each disciple. Those would be fascinating conversations <laughs> to listen to. Well, when we have a correct understanding and appreciation for who God is, Awe and faithfulness is the only appropriate response. Where we would be if Jesus had ch chosen not to, where would we be if Jesus had chosen not to come, live and die, and rise again? But we have to admit that Satan is alive and well, and he wants more than anything else to be praised and worshipped. You would think, I don't know, maybe I'm foolish, but you would think now that Satan would say, you know, that's kind of a lost cause. I ought to change my tune. <laughs> but is he ever going to change his tune? Yeah. That's not his nature. Would it be fair to take exception to Satan is alive and well? Yes, he's alive, but is he well? <laughs> he's active. Probably not. But that's the best not what, that's a state of health. And, yeah, the best uh, it's been a sense long time well. since <laughs> he was well, one diseased he's mind. He's not mentally he? well. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you for pointing that out. It's hard to even imagine the arrogance of Satan asking Jesus to bow down and worship him. I mean, 
you know, I, I a creature asking the creator, yeah. almost demanding a uh, creator yes. to do something, but he couldn't distinguish. It's been said that Satan was the first uh, evolutionist. The problem is he thought that God arrived at his position of power and whatever, but uh, and he built a barrier to keep everybody else from attaining that position. Yeah. And so here you've got a creature asking for worship yeah. from uh, from the Creator. There's no good answer other than insanity. It is. Yeah, when that's right. When you really think about it, he was in heaven before he fell. That's right. An attending angel. Yeah. Highest. That's why I take Lord. exception to the word well. He's, yeah, he's not really, really not, well. Not, nothing, Ever nothing since well. he made the decision he was going to rebel. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other examples of such arrogance out somewhere else in Scripture? Well, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar would be a grand example. He said, forget that vision thing I saw. I'm going to make a statue that's entirely gold because I intend for my descendants to rule the world forever. That's what he was really saying. Mm -hmm. My descendants will rule the world forever. And what happened? <laughs> Three young Hebrew worthies defied him and turned the whole thing upside down. Well, important other lessons to be learned from the experience of the Hebrew youth on the plain of Dura. The season of distress before God's people uh, will call for a faith that will not falter. His children must make it manifest that he is the only object of their worship and that no consideration, not even that of life itself, can induce them to make the least concession to false worship. To the loyal heart that com commands of sinful, finite men, to the loyal heart, the commands of sinful, finite men will sink into insignificance because the world, the word of the eternal God, truth will be obeyed through the, though the result be imprisonment or exile or death. But the fight over who sh should worship, who we should worship, will not end until all things are made new. And just an example of that is found in Revelation 13 and a couple of verses in Revelation 14. I'm going to read the first couple and then I'm going to ask carry to read the next clue too. This is Revelation 13, 15 through 17. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would, who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, and that, that is the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. So Satan is trying to force the entire world to worship him. And what does God say about that, Kerry? A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone who has the mark or its name. Okay. Now, if both of those powers were allowed to carry out their purpose, nobody would be left alive. Satan says, anyone who doesn't worship me will die. And God says, anybody who worships the beast will die. I guess, technically, yeah, that's right. The, Satan would kill all the God's people and God would kill all of Satan's people if you just take these quotations superficially. Are we going to survive a thing like that? Yes. <laughs> and you might think from reading that superficially that there isn't ever lasting forever and ever Hell. fury of God's anger, yeah. which yeah. doesn't fit with the rest of Scripture. No. But it fits with many people's idea of this hellfire be, and brimstone. used to be one of um, Billy Graham's key texts for that very point. But uh, if you read the rest of the Bible, remember that Revelation is just full of, of passages which reflect on things from the Old Testament. If you go back to the Old Testament, you read places like Judges 1 and 2 and, and uh, other places, Hosea, several passages in Hosea, to understand 
what God's wrath is and how he feels about it, then you have a clearer understanding of the third angel's message. We should probably say that there's a whole handout on yes. interpreting God's wrath posted on theox.org. Yes. Yeah, good point. Is it really possible to force someone to truly worship you or anyone? Because what do we say worship? Carrie, you read that definition. What is worship? Wait a minute. Now worth. You, you don't have to, huh? A person has worth. Yeah, yes. it means you look at that person and say, I really respect you, I love you, I honor you. You can't force that from anybody. There's no way you can force somebody in to worship Old, someone. You know, in the Old Testament, as you go through there, God says you don't listen. Mm -hmm. We it many times interpret it as uh, don't obey, but the word obey really comes from the Greek word hupako, eh, or how do you pronounce yeah, it there? Hupakoe, yes. Uh, 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 which means a willingness to listen. Yeah. And you, have, you develop that willingness to listen when you find out that the person is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. He has something to offer. Yeah. As, as credible. It's valuable. What, what, what kind of methods has Satan used down through the generations to try to force people to worship him? Threats, intimidation, coercion, yes. extortion, duress. And that all makes you want to love him and honor him, right? Mm -hmm. God, God <laughs> nobody really ultimately wins through intimidation. And God cannot do that, will not. Is it just contrary to his character? A character of love doesn't use intimidation and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, what did Isaiah say about Satan's original plans? Isaiah, Isaiah 14, 14 says, You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. That comes from the Good News Bible. Wow. Satan, a creature, wants to ascend to being in the same position alongside God. The Almighty. Or even be above God if he could. Mm -hmm. So, could we ever be deceived by the devil? Well, think about his, 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 his supreme motive is selfishness. So, when we are born as infants, all we can think about is our own needs, right? If we're not happy for whatever reason, wah, you know, and we, we, want, we expect somebody to come and take care of us. And for many, that selfishness never really goes away. We want things. We want a nice home. We want a nice car. We want a comfortable job. We want plenty of money, etc. Well, there's nothing essentially wrong with those things. They can take a top priority in our lives and crowd out worship of God and service to others, which are the really important ways to prepare for a life and companionship and love of God forever. Well, Revelation 14, we've already looked at some of the verses from Revelation 14, but if you read the whole chapter, or most of it, you will discover that these verses tell us that God has an eternal message of good news for us. He is challenging us to honor God, to praise His greatness and worship Him. The second and third angel's messages are warnings against worshiping the false Christ. And then that chapter ends up by talking about reaping, harvesting the results of our efforts, our plans, our worship. So the three angels' messages are followed in Revelation 14 by two pictures suggesting that the harvest is ready and that it is time to reap. Margaret, I think you have some words on that. It is interesting to note that at the end of time, worship is identified as a key issue in the great controversy for the allegiance of the human race. This worldwide announcement is, to, is a call to worship the Creator. The central issue in the final crisis will be worship. Revelation makes clear that the test will not be denial of worship, but rather who is worshiped. At the end of time, at the, end, at the time of the end, only two groups of people will be in the world, those who fear and worship the true God and those who hate the truth and are worshipers of the dragon and the beast. If worship is the central issue in the final conflict, no wonder then that God sends his end time gospel urging the inhabitants of the earth to take him seriously and to worship him as the creator the only one worthy of worship. This is from Ranko Stefanovic, mm -hmm. Revelation of Jesus Christ, Commentary on the Book of Revelation. Now, is he a teacher at Andrews? He is. Still there? 
I believe so. He may be retired now. Not absolutely sure. Ranku. So I want to. Ukrainian? No, it sounds like Serbian. It, yeah, it's a, it's a definitely Eastern European. I mean, it's, it's Slavic for sure. Mm -hmm. um, let's think about that for a moment. Think about the people that appear on television. Think about the t people who are out there entertaining the world, the Las Vegas types and that kind of stuff. You think you're going to be able to get them to worship somebody? They think they're the ones to be worshipped. Yeah, they're, yeah. What, what, how is God or Satan going to get them to worship either side? Isn't worshipping money and worshipping self, isn't that worshipping Satan? You didn't have to mention that, did you? I did. <laughs> Idolatry. Yeah, it is, absolutely. Well, don't you think that a lot of the sports and the things like the football games and the things that people pay so much attention to, they are totally involved with that. That is kind of a worship in itself. Yes. I had a patient this last week who said, you know, hopes everything gets worked out before the weekend, so he's good comfortably because he has 10 hours of football to watch on Sunday. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> he's an avid fan. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a program on television called S uh, The Worship of Sports, and it really? takes different, it's on PBS, mm -hmm. and I've been taping it, it's pretty wow. interesting. It's talking about different people who mm -hmm. excel, and people just, the adulation is yeah. amazing. Yeah. So what should be our main emphasis as we worship God? Well, the early Gratitude. church. Go ahead. Yeah. Gratitude. Absolutely. The early church experience teaches us that what they were most interested in was knowing the details of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we can pour over the Gospels, but imagine being able to talk to people who had spent the entire time of Jesus' ministry, and even people who probably knew a lot about him even when he was younger, and they would say, Tell us more, tell us more. I mean, I, I could, I could, I'm sure I could sit there for, for maybe a year, just giving one question after another. Okay, why did, what happened here? Why, why did that happen? Tell me, tell me, tell me. I we'll have time someday. We'll have time, yes. But that was based on an understanding of the Old Testament and the prophecies which pointed forward to the Messiah. So one of the, one of the challenges for the disciples was to say, whereas before their, their idea of the Messiah was the Messiah was going to do what? Conquer the Romans. Yeah. Conquer the Romans. Re restore their power and make them the pre preeminent nation in the world. And now they're having to think through all those same experiences and say, well, no, it's not going to work out quite like that. God has a different plan. And then so they have to rethink everything that happened to them. And do you suppose, I'm trying to think of how they would, if someone asked them about that, would they say, well, you know, I used to think, but now I think. You suppose there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on? Probably. Mm -hmm. Well, we can find several places in the Scripture where people are commended for studying God's Word. Can you think of one right offhand? The Bereans. The Bereans, of course. Well, that's an essential part of worship. You cannot worship God and hold Him as worthwhile unless you know about Him. And some examples, 2 Kings 22, Acts 17, <coughs> Paul talks to the Athenians, and 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17, where we have these words. Jim? Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White says, wherever the truths of the gospel are proclaimed, those who honestly desire to do right are led to a diligent searching of the scriptures. If in the closing scenes of this earth's history, those to whom testing truths are proclaimed would follow the example of the Berean searching the scriptures daily and comparing with God's word the messages brought them, there would be today a large number loyal to the precepts of God's law, where now there are comparatively few. Wow. How do you understand that? Are we failing in our job? 
Are we as excited as the Brians were about the message? Are we Most sharing? Of us aren't. Are we sharing it as if we were that excited? I think we are if we are really getting up every day and spending time with the Lord's Word. Because, mm -hmm. I, you know, if you don't do that and you're used to doing it for week after week, month after month, if something happens and you can't do it, you feel like you've been deprived. Yeah. So I think the more, it's kind of like exercise. The more you do, the easier it gets and you think better. Yeah. Uh, if I don't get my exercise, if I don't get my chance to do my Bible study in the mornings, it's a bad day. Mm -hmm. You really have missed something. Yeah. Well, how could our church in the 21st century come together and study God's Word more effectively and conclude by worshiping God more correctly? How do you think we could do that? Is that what Sabbath school classes are supposed to be mm -hmm. for? That's a good start. Yeah. But I think personal study is almost the highest form of worship in a way. Because that's where God's Spirit can open your mind to what He mm -hmm. wants you to hear if you're listening. I can tell you that I teach several classes. Um, Bible classes, some in, among non-Adventists and, and several among Adventists. And what I'm finding, unfortunately, as you go along and you talk about something and you mention a Bible story, well, maybe something is not the most common, frequent things, and you get a blank look. Hmm. And people don't know what in the world you're talking about. And it's not just among non-Adventists. Hmm. Are we each firmly grounded, firmly enough grounded in the scriptures so that we could give a clear answer to anyone who asks us about the truths in which we believe. First Peter 3.15, you remember the statement there? Let me just read that. That might be worth remembering. But have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. So this is talking about worship. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hopes you have in you. Anyone who asks the hope you have in you. Peter apparently recognized that new truths would be revealed by a careful study of Scripture. Second Peter 1.12 From the Good News Bible. And so I will always remind you of these matters, even though you already know them and are firmly grounded in the truth you have received. How was Peter going to make it possible for, us to, for him to always remind us? The Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, which is really Peter's Gospel. He gave it to Mark, and Mark wrote it down. So he says, I know I'm going to die pretty soon. I'm not going to survive very long here in this terrible prison here in Rome. But I'm going to make it possible for you at all times to remember. And so when we read the book of Mark, you're really hearing words from the Mamertine prison in Rome, probably. Well, study of the ancient customs and of documents from very early days of the Christian church suggests that during fellowship meals, someone would offer a special blessing over the bread and drink in memory of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, I've been thinking about that comment. How do you suppose that would actually happen? Now, we usually think, okay, let's say a blessing for the food. What is this saying? It's almost like maybe halfway through the meal, someone would stand up and say, let's remember that the death and, re and resurrection of Jesus has made it possible for us to eat this food. Mm -hmm. Be together. Yeah. Community. Of course, they were looking forward to what? It's very uh, soon returned. They were sure that Jesus was coming back right away. I mean, what does he have to wait for? At least that's what they thought. Well, prayer, of course, is one of the important aspects of worship. Um, there's a lot of places. Look at, for example, Acts 1.14. They gathered frequently to pray as a group, together with the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So, um, this was a, I mean, it was, this was a frequent thing. Notice that on two of these occasions, two of these occasions happened because Peter, and in one case, John, were miraculously released from prison. If I had read the other two passages, 
Remember that Peter and John were arrested and put in prison in the middle of the night. God released them and told them to go out and stand in the, in the courtyard of the temple and preach. And the, the Sanhedrin got up and they said, bring those two guys from prison out here. We want to try them. Huh? You mean they're not in prison? Where? Oh, they're preaching over there <laughs> and, <laughs> the by your front court. door. Temple court preaching. <laughs> yeah. And then Peter, of course, that time when he was supposed to be killed and the shackles came off and he escaped from prison with all those, what, 16 people guarding him or something like that and disappeared. Well, have we as a church experienced the unity which comes from praying together? I mean, think, <coughs> of, think about those people. If you had been part of that group that was gathered probably in the house of, of John Mark's parents in the upper room, praying for the release of Peter, and you know that he's supposed to be killed the next day, and all of a sudden someone knocks on the door, and there's Peter, how would that impact your understanding, your belief in God? Solidify it. Absolutely. Of they didn't believe that it was him. <laughs> yeah, not to begin with. <laughs> didn't believe that, that young well, girl. Yeah. Peter's Rhoda. here. Rhoda. Rhoda. Rhoda, yeah, Rhoda, yeah. He's there, he's there. Come on, what do you mean? It must be his, his angel. Well, no, he's standing at the front door. Yeah, finally they said, well, maybe we should open the front door and have a look. <laughs> she oh, so boy. so excited she didn't think about opening the You know, yeah. when they were the praying, they must not really have believed that their prayer would be answered. You wonder, don't you? Yeah. I just read a story this week about... I just read a story this week about uh, a gentleman working up in Canada, and um, he got caught in a terrible, terrible uh, snowstorm. And the snow was piled up on both sides of the road and so forth. And through a se sequence of events that I don't, don't want to, won't take time to talk about, he had to head home late at night, finished one of his jobs, head home late at night. And he had planned to stop and get gas. And he realized about halfway home, he's driving through this little canyon with snow from the snow plows piled up on both sides of the road. And he looks down and the gas <laughs> registry is completely out. And then the, the car starts to sputter. And, you know, he knows absolutely he's going to. And he had previously had a bad situation out in the winter, cold, and had had a couple of toes frozen. And he, he knew, the, the doctor had told him, he says, if, that, if this ever happens to you again, you're going to lose both feet. Mm -hmm. And he just started praying. He prayed and he prayed and then he said, God, I'm sure that if you want me to survive and, and spread your gospel, you can make, get me home. And he turned the key on, back on the car and the car started up and he drove 27 miles home. And the next morning he tried to start the car, it wouldn't start at all. On an empty tank. Refused. Empty tank. <laughs> yeah. So, well, <clears throat> members of a family virtually always unite in opposition and defense against an external en enemy. They may squabble with each other incessantly, but when an external enemy shows up, they stand shoulder to shoulder, and we all know about those kind of occasions. Another very important aspect of worship is the Seventh-day Sabbath. Clearly, one of the major ways of maintaining fellowship and unity is based on the fact that we come together to worship on Sabbath. Notice these words from Ellen White about the effects of faithfully observing, observing of the seventh-day Sabbath. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was to keep this truth ever before the minds of men that God instituted the Sabbath in Eden. And so long as the fact that He is our Creator continues to be a reason why we should worship Him, so long the Sabbath will continue as a sign and a memorial. Had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and, affliction and affections would have been led to the Creator as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. Wow. <clears throat> you know, that brings a question then. That's, what happened? That's mentioned in the Great Controversy, page 437. Yes, yes. Yeah, go ahead. What would happen before the creation of this earth? Didn't God do a perfect job in, in educating the uh, heavenly intelligences? We, uh, and then uh, we get to Revelation 12. A third of them were swept down. Yeah. And uh, the deceiver of the whole world, which we are living in this de a mm -hmm. sea of deception now. It just uh, seems to be no, no bounds. 
Well, clearly the Sabbath for, is for us intended to be a reminder of God's creation. Creation was the first issue that led Satan to rebel. He wanted to be a creator, like Michael the Archangel. When we worship the two creators, the true creators, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are recognizing that Satan and all that he stands for are not to be worshipped for any reason whatsoever. Well, in the 21st century, when someone mentions worship, the discussion often turns to styles of music, the organization of the divine service, etc. But true worship can happen anywhere, at any time, when we turn our thoughts to God and all that he or they have done for us and will do for us because of who they are. Would it be correct to say that worship is the Christian's thank is the Christian's thankful and awesome response to God for all that he has done for us? Mm -hmm. Are you thankful that he has answered the questions in the great controversy to the satisfaction of all who study it carefully? Are you thankful that he has proved a me provided a means for our salvation? What, do, what does it mean to you to know that Jesus, the King of Heaven, died for you? And awesome. for those of you who've read Spirit of Prophecy, you know that repeatedly Ellen White says he would have died for one human being. That's awesome. We worship God not just because of what he or they have done or will do for us, but also because of the very nature of their beings, the love that they have demonstrated in the government that has resulted from that love. So could we correctly identify the meaning of worship? What does worship actually mean to you? Worship should mean holding someone or something in our thinking as of true ultimate worth, as worthship, if we could put it in a semi-understandable modern term, it would be worthship. Is God worth it? Have we carefully thought through the two sides in the great controversy? If we focus on what God has done versus what Satan has done, isn't that sufficient reason for worshiping God and rejecting Satan? I mean, of course, you know that Satan, one of Satan's most successful things in our, our days is to convince people that he doesn't exist. Yeah. Once upon a time, when I was working in Africa, someone, a non-Adventist lady who was a Christian, Asked, found out that I had some training in, in the Bible and so forth. She said, well, would you be willing to come and lead a class? Come to my house and I'll invite some friends and we'll go through the Bible. I said, sure, I'd love to. We started through it and um, we only gotten in little ways and I was talking about the great controversy and how it impacted the, the, the stories in Genesis and so forth. And then one evening, a, a, an older couple came there and she said, oh, I want you to meet these people. He is the president of the seminary up here out of town from another Protestant organization. And so I thought, okay, so he's well educated. So I went on talking about the great controversy and so forth and for pretty soon he couldn't stand it anymore. He says, why are we talking about this when we know perfectly well that the devil doesn't exist? Did he think that God didn't exist either? I was so blown away, I just, I said, well, you know, the Bible talks about the devil, and so I'm going to talk about the devil. I mean, what else can you say? Good answer. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <clears throat> just blown away. Well, how much is involved in worship? It certainly involves honor and respect. Does it also include service and obedience? What would you say is a reasonable response to all that God has done for us? What should our response be? Worship. Okay. And what should that include? Praise, gratitude, love. I think love. Where, where your mind where, is. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, in Spending a way, worship is a him. lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you think about it, it's a lifestyle. And it's it includes... where your thinking is. Yes. Yeah. It includes obedience and service. Yeah. But it's right just six inches between your ears. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Your attitude, your awareness of who God is and who you are. So we need to be very clear, and I want this, especially you out there, to think about it. As the end approaches, it's not going to be a question of whether or not we worship God. As many would say today, well, I don't, I don't pay any attention to religion, I don't want to have anything to do with that. It's not going to be a question about whether we worship, it's going to be about who we worship. Everyone is going to worship 
either God or Satan. Now, as Gordon suggested earlier, that might mean we worship Satan in the form of money, we worship Satan in the form of power and so forth, or greed or whatever it is. But in one way or another, we're going to worship one or other of the two sides in the great controversy. I think when we turn our back on God, we are worshiping Satan in a way. Yeah. Could we be deceived by Satan? I'm going to ask that question again. When we consider the incredible contrast between what Satan has done versus what God has done, how could we possibly agree to join Satan's side? Review, review once again what examples we might have of how God has been worshipped down through the centuries. Look at Isaiah 1, verses 10 to 20. I mean, this is just almost unbelievable. Jerusalem. This is, this is Isaiah, his first sermon, in effect. He shows up, in, he, he lives in Jerusalem. He's a relative of the king, okay? He's a relative of the king. So he shows up probably somewhere near the gate of the temple, and he says, Jerusalem, your rulers and your people are like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's trying really hard to make himself popular, right? <laughs> yes. Listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Pay attention to what our God is teaching you. He says, do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me? I have had more than enough of the sheep you burn as sacrifices and of the fat of your fine animals. I am tired of the blood of bulls and sheep and goats. Who asked you to bring me all this when you come to worship me? Who asked you to do all this trampling about in my temple? It's useless to bring your offerings. I am disgusted with the smell of the incense you burn. I cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths, or your religious gatherings. They are all corrupted by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals and holy days. They are a burden that I am tired of bearing. When you, lift up, when you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. The Lord says, now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin, but I will wash you as clean as snow. Although your stains are deep red, you will be as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will eat the good things of the land produces. But if you defy me, you are doomed to die. I, the Lord, have spoken. Do you think they were praising Isaiah, or were they ready to stone him? Verse 9 says, you're willing to obey, but not willing to listen and take instruction. Yeah. But he wasn't threatening to kill anybody there. No. He just said, you're going to die, mm -hmm. which he had said in, uh, was it, uh, Psalms 82, 6 and 7. He's talking about the gods that weren't God, weren't the creator. They're going to die like men. Yeah, well... In those days, it was common for an ordinary person who would be approaching a king for some reason to actually kiss his feet. That was a recognition of their dependence or submission to the person they were approaching. Surely this implies more than just a physical act. So to worship God is to recognize his greatness and majesty. Are we willing to accept the idea that he's Lord of our lives? Some of you may know that in the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, there is a statue of Peter, right up near the throne, close to the, close to the front, and he's sitting with one of his feet mm -hmm. sticking out like this. And that foot gets worn off by people touching it and kissing it until it's worn away, they have to replace the foot. Yeah, well, true worship has several important features. Let's think about this for a moment. First and foremost, it is directed at God and Him alone. For example, Look at Deuteronomy 6.13. Honor the Lord your God, worship only Him, and make your promises in His name alone. That's clear. What did Jesus say to Satan when he wanted him to worship Him in Matthew 4.10? Then Jesus answered, Go away, Satan. The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. That's pretty clear, right? Uh, I'm losing my... There it is. Well... Second, it is never forced. It is a response, spontaneous response to the character of God and His redemptive actions um, on our behalf. It begins from the heart and not from the expectations of others. Third, 
Worship is not simply a Sabbath morning activity or part of a worship service. It is a lifestyle. Jim, there's your word. We are to live and breathe our responses to what God has done for us. The living creatures in the throne room, pictured in Revelation 4 that we talked about at the beginning of our lesson, worship continually, day and night. They don't get tired. That's, that's, that's not what's happening there. They are so excited about being next to God and thinking of all the things that He has done. While such intense focused worship is not possible in our lives, this figure underscores the idea that each word and action of ours should bring honor to the name of God. Quoted from our adult teacher, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 147. If we become true worshipers of God, Will we be attracted to others who are true worshipers to God? Mm -hmm. We should be. Mm -hmm. Birds of a feather flock together, right? Mm -hmm. We have reviewed many of the reasons for worshiping God. Why do you think worship seems to be such an important part of the Three Angels' messages? Are we giving worship adequate emphasis in our times together and our studies together and our attempts to reach out those who are not of our church? What is the relationship between the prayers and songs and activities we normally do in Sabbath school and church to the true worship of God? Why is it that many, especially of our young people, have come to think that our church services are boring and therefore are leaving the church in great numbers? Could we make the worship of God really attractive once again? What could we do to accomplish that? Does this require telling more exciting stories? Does it require being coming up with better sound bites that they're so used to hearing from the public news media? Or do they really need to get to know Jesus? And how could we how could we bring that about? That's our challenge for our young people. We need to convince them that getting to know God and what He can do for us, and if we talked more often about what God has done for us on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, if we could come together once in a while in church and just explain, just talk about the miracles that God has performed in our own lives, would that make things more interesting? I think so. And I think you would find that to be true. Think about it in your own personal experience as you talk with your young people. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these lessons which we have prepared for us at such cost and such effort. We thank you for what you have done for us, and may we remember the miracles that are a part of our daily experience, a part of our experience, and, and how we might be able to use those stories, those ideas, to share with others so that we might encourage them to, to join your cause. Bless us as we seek to reveal you to others each day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>